Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Bathurst Baptist Church this morning. Special welcome to people who are visiting us today and people we haven't seen before. We um, hope that this will be a lovely time that you share with us and with the Lord. Um, I need to make a few housekeeping calls here. Um, we're not singing yet at the moment. We're not standing either, but you are allowed to hum as long as it comes out of your ears and not your mouth. <laughs> and you're allowed to tap your foot, I think. <laughs> That's not sending any bad waves out and about. So you can tap your foot and you can hum, but please, we're not allowed to sing and we're not allowed to stand. But I'm sure that the Lord will bless your heart, even with those restrictions. And we do remind you too, for the people who worship here regularly, that um, offering is being collected, but not in the usual way. We would ask that you will remember to place your offering in the bag that's on the, the um, shelf at the back there. Okay. I just want to open in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today at the beginning of what is looking like it's going to be a lovely day, we want to give you thanks for all the things that you provide us with all the time. We thank you, loving Heavenly Father, for all your blessings day by day by day, things that we recognise as blessings from you and things that we take so much for granted we forget where it comes from so we lift our hearts in thanksgiving heavenly father this morning and we ask too lord that just for these few moments now that um, you will cut us loose for a little while from the world around us lift our hearts in worship pray heavenly father that you will enhance our understanding and deepen our love for you, Lord Jesus. So we commit this time to you and ask that what we do and what we say and what we sing will be a blessing to you as well as to us. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking a lot about being followers and following. It's fairly obvious. We've been um, talking about it a fair bit, but what does it really mean? We use these terms and sometimes we're not really, we're a bit blasé about it. But when Jesus says, follow me, he means learn from me, grow in me. And that's easy enough when everything's going well. It's easy to say thank you to God for all the blessings when things are good and when all is well. But it's during the difficult times that we really learn and it's in the learning that we grow. And what we learn about becomes the heart, the very core of our relationships with God. As we come to our first song this morning and as you uh, <clears throat> tap your toe or hum, I just want you to take note of the words and take note of the sunshine and the shadows. Closes in, Lord, still I will say, 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be Jesus and when we choose to follow sooner or later the Lord leads us into the tough patches into the shadows things get a bit icky and a bit uncomfortable and we find ourselves saying what just happened what am I why am I here how did I get into this the fact is that these are also part of the journey this is also part of the following and Jesus leads us into it he takes us by the hand and he says come with me and you might question it but the thing is do you hold back do you choose to trust him do you choose to keep following words of our next song will also bring that to the fore. Thank you. Thank you. 
And then what do you find? You find that following can be costly. Yep, for sure, it's costly. And when you follow Jesus and walk with him through those hard times, when you're counting the cost, what are you learning? How is it growing you? I want to tell you a story just now about a friend of mine. My friend and her husband bought a lovely block of land a few years ago and they set out to build a dream home for their family. They designed the house themselves, they found a builder and work began and of course it was very exciting. They lived in a little cottage that came with the land that they bought. So they were there from day one. They saw it from the beginning and it was really, really exciting. As time passed though, they began to notice that some things didn't seem quite right. Neither of them had any sort of building experience at all and they could only trust the expert. Well... About halfway through the build, the expert walked off the job. He left them high and dry with a half-finished, badly bungled, incomplete house. We've all heard that sort of story before. It's not altogether, unfortunately, not altogether uncommon. And my friends found themselves in a battlefield with landmines exploding all over the place. What did I say a minute ago? You start asking questions. How do I get into this? After battling this out with the builder for about three years, the whole thing was taken to the Supreme Court towards the end of last year. And it ended up being a nil-all draw. The builder, who was actually suing my friends, came up empty-handed and so did my friends. Nobody achieved anything out of all of that. But just before Christmas, I sent my friend a message, you know, best wishes for Christmas few words of encouragement, how are you going, that sort of thing. And this was her response. Mind you, this was a tiny part of her full response. I had a text about that long, but this was one paragraph. Now that there has been three months to let the ash settle, things are looking different. A lot still doesn't make sense, but I don't care anymore about that. I don't need justice. His will is so much better and his design is my deepest desire. The best thing I learned was to trust God more, to experience his beautiful presence through the storms and to build a bit of backbone for the next trial. Tears are welling in my eyes as I read this on Christmas morning, just gone couldn't stop crying and I'm going to start in a minute if I don't help stop myself. She got it. My lovely young friend gets it. What we learn in the hard times is what counts. We learn to trust. We learn that God has a higher purpose. We learn that God's perspective on a successful outcome is usually different to ours and we learn to submit to his idea of surrender and success. There's a lovely ending to her part of the, this part of the story though. One of the things that made their house unique was a building material that they were using. It was very different, very new quite innovative and it was a it was made from wood but it was a different way they were building their house in a different way to the normal 
too long to go into here. I won't explain it any further than, th than that. But at the beginning, they got a sample and a sample of this particular type of timber and it was quite a chunk. To my friends, it represented what their house would become. To the original builder, it represented a pioneering project that could boost his sales and boost his business. To the interior designer, it was a reference point for all the decorating that she was, he or she was going to do inside the house. But as things began to unwind and to become a bit acrimonious and prickly and painful, that lump of wood lost its glow of promise and it became a doorstop in their house, a bit of nothing. It was just discarded. And then at some point it disappeared. It just vanished. My friend had no idea where it went. She just noticed one day that that thing wasn't there anymore. Two days before Christmas, it came back as a gift from their new builder. It was a beautiful hand-turned bowl. And my friend learned something else. The very thing that represented and what became the bane of her life represents now in its new form the beautiful thing that God was doing in her life. Tearing away the ugliness and going for the beauty inside. Making something beautiful of her life. will be costly and the cost can come in any number of ways. The Supreme Court, yep, very costly. <clears throat> but God wants us to succeed. God wants us to succeed in the trial because the perfection of our faith is important to him and the trial of our faith is important for us. Just for this last part of this, this part of the service, the song we chose for this part is really a prayer. And as we sing it, I want you to turn your eyes upon Jesus and sing this prayer for him because it's all about him really, isn't it? What we do, what we believe, what we think, what we say, what we go through in our lives and how we come out at the other, at the other end. It's all about him. Use this as a prayer to your loving 
Lord and Saviour. follow a saviour like that? I do. Does that encourage you to follow a saviour like that? Somebody who loves you, somebody who wants the best for you, in it and through it all, he's there for you. Nothing ever random happens when you're following the Lord. No, it's never random. It feels like it. And you ask the questions and you wonder why. But it's never random when God's in charge of it. Isn't that wonderful? Smile at me and nod your heads. Don't you love that? <laughs> Very good. All right, let's just pray together now. <clears throat> How wonderful it is, Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, to know you and to know that you know us and you love us. Lord, I just want to lift my heart in praise to you today, <clears throat> to worship you more fully, to know you more dearly and to follow you more clearly. Heavenly Father, I want to pray today too for all the people that we know and that um, are in our church community and in other places as well. All of us have somebody on our heart and on our mind at the moment 
who are going through the shadow times, who are going through the rough patches, who are needing encouragement, Lord, I pray that you will be who you are in their times of need. Be for them what they need. We lift them before you as in our hearts and in our minds we name people before your throne this morning and we give you thanks, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Roy. When I looked at the reading this morning, uh, it was, it's familiar. It's two verses from Philippians. And I don't know whether you've experienced it, but sometimes there are parts of Scripture which sort of come at particular times and are very encouraging and uplifting. And I think this is one that I've bumped into. I don't know whether that's what you do with the Word of God, but anyhow, you, yes. So, from Philippians 4 and verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I like that term, uh, Roy, bump. The Bible bumps me a lot. Um, I've just get this thing happening. There we go. Whoops, it's up there, but it's not on here. So how does that work? Ah, I don't know. That's better. That works now. Um, yeah, we're looking at uh, following, and today particularly, we're looking at growing. This time of year is always a little bit strange for our family. Um, Valentine Day comes around and it's a bit weird in our family going, what's weird about Valentine's Day? Well, it's not so much Valentine's Day, it's the fact that um, 17 years ago, Mary Ann was in hospital at this particular time, two weeks earlier than she was supposed to be, uh, because she was giving birth in a little while, in a couple more hours yet, to Jackson, it's his 17th birthday today. The thing, oh yes, happy birthday. <laughs> um, I, didn't, um, I didn't say that to elicit a, a, a clap, but thank you for encouraging him like that. The thing is with, um, when, when, when Jackson was born, he was little, you know, that, that's what babies are. Um, he was a little kid, you know? And the thing that I've noticed over 17 years is he's grown. And he keeps growing. And he keeps growing through all of the difficulties and through all of the troubles that, that, that we have in our growing up process. He keeps growing. And we, to a point, expect that. But just like us growing up into our adulthood, our spirituality does that as well. We become Christians and we, we grow bucket loads. And then we get to a point, a maturity, and we either slow down and sometimes we stop. And that stopping process, I'll put it this way, is just not biblical. It's just not the way that it's designed to happen. And because too often we see discipleship as an educational process for new Christians when really what we should be seeing it as is a lifelong journey of drawing closer to Jesus. 
And when we don't have the attitude of it being a lifelong journey, we stagnate. One scholar said, we never arrive, we never know it all, we never have it all together, yet we aspire to maturity. It's an interesting comment, isn't it? I'm going to look at a couple of that passages and we're going to go back to that passage which Roy read to us. This one here comes from um, uh, Philippians uh, chapter 3. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's a couple of things here. Firstly, he hasn't made it on his own. So he's kind of aware of the fact that it's not all his effort that gets us there. He's got help. Now, we know where the help comes from. As, as developing Christians, we know that the Holy Spirit speaks into our life in amazing ways and we have what I call aha uh-huh experiences. Mayo's just explained it differently. Um, Roy's used the term... The Bible bumps into us. I say they're aha uh-huh experiences. You ever get those? You read something in Scripture and you go, aha, uh-huh, I get it. Or you have a situation in life and you go, oh, I get what's happening. We don't make it on our own. Things around us, and when I say people, the church, help us to develop spiritually, and that is under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We don't do it by ourselves. Notice it says here too that he presses on, he works at it. One of the biggest problems we have in modern um, Australian Christian culture is we've stopped pressing on. The statistics are pretty scary about how many people these days are reading their Bibles and praying every day. It has come from a peak about 1952 or 53 apparently where there was 80% of Christians in, in, I know New South Wales, I'm not sure about the national figures and we're now down to about 22% of people who profess to be Christians who are reading their Bible and praying daily. See the drop? Are we pressing on? Some of us aren't, okay? We aren't pressing on. And I think we're seeing that in some of the things that happens around us. Now, here's the other thing too is this guy, Paul, is aiming at the future. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's an aim to be spiritually mature. There's an aim to be continuing in the relationship and journey with Jesus. Paul is saying, let's keep going. Let's keep heading that direction. And the aim is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And this is where we take a mental departure. Most of the time, we view maturity as something like Jackson's experiencing. He's growing older, he's getting to understand what life's about, and he's growing into himself. Sometimes I think he's growing out the top of himself. But within that, what is happening... He is developing as a bloke, as a young man. Okay? That's what's happening. Are we having that concept with our spirituality? Are we aiming to grow out the top of ourselves? Are we, oh, hang on, let's look at the terminology here. Are we pressing on towards the goal for the prize of the upward, what's it talking about here? What's this upward call? What's it the upward call? What's God called you to? Now, some times we talk about the call that God has on our lives and we talk about it from a clergy perspective. You know, I've been called to minister and to preach the gospel and that's my calling. But what's... This is talking to all of us at once. What's this upward call? Notice it's using the term upward. It's the call to be obedient to God in an upward passage. That's the ethos of where the whole, the whole structure is going. What has God called us to? God has called us to, to be in the following journey of being part of his people. 
He's called us to be in the following development of our own spirituality and he has called us to be in obedience to him. Okay, there's other things around it, but we'll stick to the three at the moment. So it's ongoing. We get that. We understand that. It's sometimes we don't let it come into our brain thought processes. Now, my assumption here is that the people of this church and those visiting have had good biblical teaching over the years. I know the pastors who have been here in the past. They've been good, solid preachers. So my assumption is that we have in our brains a good concept of orthodoxy. There's only one problem with orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is great when it sets the agenda for life. But orthodoxy is useless if there is no orthopraxis. Now let me explain that word. Orthodoxy is the good theology that we have or the good teaching we have. Orthopraxis is the good practical. Praxis, practical. If we, if our orthodoxy doesn't go to orthopraxis, then it has actually failed in what it's designed to do. Orthodoxy is to teach us the good things, the right things of Scripture, and it should be expressed in the orthopraxis. Now, you're getting that. It goes from this to this. When it doesn't get to this, there is no maturity. That's the problem. That's the problem. And there can be so many blockages along the way. So, so many blockages along the way. And sometimes having kids can be a blockage. And you go, what, what, what? Because it takes your attention away. Before Marianne and I had kids, we were really focused on church stuff. We were involved in literally everything. And Jackson come along and Marianne all of a sudden couldn't come to everything because she had to put Jackson to bed at 7.30. And then Flynn came along, that was a real distraction. See, what it is, even great things like children can be a spiritual stop. But the amazing thing is that we develop through that if we do it right, if we look at scripture and if we look at good examples of other people and how they're running their family, we actually develop, we actually develop into a different orthopraxis. But if it's not developing, it's not going anywhere. We'll go on from that. Part of spiritual growth is the development of wisdom. Would you agree with that? Okay, some nods there and some other blank looks. That's okay. Um, and it's a simulation into our lifestyle. And I've said this before, that wisdom in the Bible is not about knowledge, but how to use the knowledge we accumulate. That's biblical wisdom. And we see that particularly uh, in the book of uh, Proverbs. I'm going to read, now there's a number of, pass a number of um, different things here. There's, there's, firstly, there's a, um, a passage from, um, actually there's a number of different parts of Proverbs. So I'm going to read them through to you. It's not consecutive, so I'm jumping around the book of Proverbs. Uh, so just follow along if you can see that. It says in uh, Proverbs 1.7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 2.2, 2, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. And then further on in that chapter in verses 6 and 7, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. Verse 9 from the same chapter. Uh, then you will understand righteousness and justice and, and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. In verse, chapter 3, my son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. In verse four, and, and chapter 4 and verse 5, get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Now, Proverbs teaches wisdom on and on and on. My grandfather used to say, and he was actually told this by Professor Morling when grandfather was in Bible college, he said, read, if you want to be a wise pastor, read a chapter of Proverbs a day. Okay? And there's 31, so you get it all in. I'm not sure exactly what you're supposed to do when you get 
when there's only to February and there's three left, whether you have to actually bump the whole three chapters at the end. But my grandfather did that for many, many years. And he did it because he said he wasn't overly wise, so he had to accumulate wisdom. Now, I think Margaret's the only person who can remember my grandfather as a pastor here. Um, you'd probably agree with his statement there sometimes, wouldn't you, that he wasn't overly wise and he had to... Yeah, anyway, we'll leave that alone. But he did teach me. Proverbs teaches that wisdom over and over and over again in every chapter and it is expounded and it is repeated. Why? Because wisdom is something that we need to live on. How does one grow in wisdom? We're just going to use one example on how to grow in wisdom. Okay, over the next few weeks there'll be a few more things that go in here that accumulate for us some different aspects of spiritual growth. But this is where we come to that passage that was read to us before. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if, any, sorry, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. There's a couple of things here. The list is about developing. It's not necessarily a growth process in its thought process. You're going, what? It's not you get, uh, you get truth and then, uh, then, there's a honor, then you become honourable and then you become just. It doesn't work like that. What this list is, we are to be developing all of those things at once. Okay? I'm, I'm sure that you can start with truth and then move on to on, uh, being honourable and move on to whatever is just in your process of getting there. But just because you, you, you start with truth and you get down to whatever is commendable doesn't mean that you've left truth behind, is what I'm saying. You need to still have truth and, and, and honour and whatever is just and whatever is pure and whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. You need to be building all of them and developing all of them. And if we leave one of them out, we have a blockage in our, in our development process. We're told here, and if you want to look down there, to think on these things. Notice on the, at the end of verse 8, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. The Greek word logosomai is... Um, the word think, and it's interesting. Um, we've translated it think. In other, in other um, translations, it's slightly different. But as I had a look at it this week, and I couldn't actually remember what the word was, so I went back to my lexicon and I had a look. And it, and it is more literally translated as take an inventory. So as your life continues, take an inventory of where you're at. In other words, evaluate your life. Remember what we do at communion, okay? It says in the passage that we are to examine ourselves. That's what it's talking about. Take an inventory of your life and see how truthful you are, how honourable you are, how just you are, how pure you are, how lovely you are, and how commendable you are. Work on those things. How am I working with that? Now, and once... Once you've done your evaluation, you can say, well, I'm not, I'm not up to scratch with this. And you can adjust and you can develop. But if we never look at where we're at spiritually, guess what happens? We actually don't pinpoint our weaknesses. And unfortunately in churches, what happens if you don't pinpoint your weakness, somebody else surely will. Sometimes, unfortunately, it's the way it goes, isn't it? So work it through. Take an inventory. Now, I want you to stop here for a second. And we're only going to do the first one. Whatever is true. How is my truth in my life at the moment? Have a think about that. I'm not going to ask for hands up and, and answers to questions. But what I'm going to say is, have a think. Where is my truth at the moment? How truthful am I?
interesting thought process, isn't it? Now we're going to skip one down. And how, how commendable am I? And you go, what's, what's this mean? What's that mean? How, how, how am I commendable to God? How, how do people look at me and say, oh, he's a commendable Christian? He lives like a Christian should. He is a good reputa- has a good reputation for Jesus. Where's my commendability? Have a think about that for a minute. Where do I fit? Now we ask ourselves another question is, how do I get better at it? Now musicians and music teachers will tell you, practice doesn't make perfect and my son's music teacher was to- told him this the other day, it makes better. I used to always say when I was teaching kids music, the more you practice, the better you'll get. The more we practice our commendability, the better we'll get at it. Notice in the next verse, it says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. So, Paul's saying, now look at my lifestyle, and this is really scary, where he's saying, look at me, what you've heard from me and you've seen in me, do that. I mean, our main role model for that is what you see in Jesus and what you read of Jesus, do that. Understand where I'm coming from? Do that. Practice these things. So, this, and that's a great verse to go through this orthodoxy and orthopraxis thing. What you have learned and received and heard, orthodoxy. Practice these things. Okay, you take them and you practice it. And you do it. You do it. And, there's, and you think, well, that's a fairly simple message for today. Is it? Well, it's a fairly simple and, and in your face kind of passage. It's not hard to understand. Actually, most of Scripture is not hard to understand unless we confuse it ourselves. If we go through it and piece, piece by piece and think about it and work it through, the Bible is written in a way that we can understand it. <laughs> it's only theologians that make it more tricky or people who want to argue about it to confuse each other. This kind of thinking has consequence, doesn't it? If we are to think about the good stuff, then what happens to the bad stuff? Well, by inference, we're not thinking about it. You notice that? The bad stuff we don't think on. What if, what if you're confronted with bad stuff in your life every day? Don't dwell on it, I suppose, is the teaching there. Work through that. Work through that. Again, that passage teaches us. But where do we go? How does that work for us? Okay, it's one of those interesting things, isn't it? That we've got this and it sounds nice and it's great and we can walk out the door and say, oh, well, that was okay today. Mayo did a great job. You know, singing was good. John was a bit weird, but, you know, we had a good time at church today. If you go out of here today and you haven't confronted what this passage says to you, regardless of what I say, you've been able to read it, then coming to church has been a waste for you. Where does it go? You see, the flip side of, the flip side of this verse is, if you want to translate it from a negative, is, is you're saying, whatever is not true... Whatever is not honourable, whatever is not just, whatever is not pure, whatever is not lovely, whatever is not commendable, guess what? Don't think on those things. So you've got the practicality of, li- of thinking about good stuff and you've also got the flip side of that going, I'm not going to think about the bad stuff. Okay, And I'm not necessarily talking about situational things here, about health and stuff like that. What I'm talking about is the lifestyle stuff that, that gets us down that gets us down. Sometimes I I just want to turn the news off because it's just so negative. And then you hang out for one... I mean, Channel 10 News has one positive thing every day. They always make sure they've got a good... uh, sort of a, a nice story in it. So you hang out for the one story, you know, of someone looking after a koala or whatever they're doing. 
You hang out for the one story, but mostly, even even the sport news, there's always a loser. Then again, how would the Australian Open go if there were no winners? That would be a bit strange, wouldn't it? So here we've got, we've got to be realistic, but how do we pull that into our lives? Okay, and there's lots of ways of doing this, but let, let, let's just take something. Okay, I'm going to ask a question. Who has a television? Who watches the television daily? More than daily, regularly, okay? Okay? We all have this, this concept of television. Yet, when I watch the television, and I've deliberately done this over this last week, I've noticed there's some things which aren't true, aren't honourable, aren't just, and are not pure, and not lovely, and not commendable. How should I put this into practice with my television? Now, it's much easier these days because we have remotes. In the old day, you actually had to get off and turn it up. Okay? Now, remotes are easy. You can go, this is not appropriate for me to be watching and click. Has anyone done that this week? Okay? Good on you. A couple of people. Thank you. We need to have that thought process that if it's not appropriate, we go click. And it's not just because the kids are watching. It's for our good. It's for our good. When do we turn it off? Do we turn it off because of the sex scenes or the senseless violence? Okay, you'd have to turn the news off for the senseless violence. Uh, or you know, the smutty comedy. Hey, the list can go on and on and on and on. And we just leave it on and either just cope with it and then it becomes part of our thought process. And then we actually turn it on to watch the next show that we know is going to have that kind of stuff in it. You see what I'm saying? There's practical ways for us to live this verse, but it has consequence. It has consequence. And part of our growth as Christians is identifying what is good and bad for us and then making the decision what to do with the good and the bad, isn't it? What are the things we should be turning off? I remember back in, um, this would be back in the 80s, um, on one of the radio stations in Newcastle, they had uh, a radio play which was um, suggestive, to say the least. And all of the kids that I was ministering to were all listening to it every day. And I thought, you yeah, know, okay, I better listen to see what they're going on about. And the funny thing was, the storyline was good. So after a period of time, I was just ignoring the smutty stories and the smutty jokes to listen to the storyline. And then after a period of time, I noticed that I was actually laughing at the jokes. See what can happen very, very easily. And back then, I was this professional Christian youth worker. I shouldn't have been doing that. I recognised that at some stage and turned it off. Was I better off because of it? Yeah. I had no idea what the kids were talking about anymore because they would talk about it every, every time that I was up at school. Did you listen to this? And they'd be into talking about it. I'd go, no, I didn't listen to it. It's not good for me. Not good for me. I read recently that most commercials on television are based on sex, greed and misinformation. So I tried an experiment. Um, I decided I'd read my Bible during the commercials. So... In one show, this is amazing, in one show I read all of 1 Corinthians just by reading in the commercials. Okay? It was good for me. And if those commercials are based on sex, greed and misinformation, I wasn't exposing myself to that. I was exposing myself to the letter of Timothy. Now, I don't know whether it had any... Was my behaviour better that day, darling? Okay, sorry, not sure it works. Uh, but you know what I'm saying there? I cut out the negativity. I cut out the bad stuff. I cut out whatever, what wasn't true. I cut out wasn't, what wasn't honourable. I cut out what wasn't just for that period of time and I filled it with something positive. As I made mention of that to someone on the phone I was talking to, he said, oh, I do exercises. I mean, yeah, I'll just keep reading, thank you. 
And he says, but I got really fit. Of course we do. We've, we, we, there's, there's ways that we can cut out the negatives. There's ways that we can cut out the things that are bad for us. But we've got to be careful that we don't replace it with something that's still not commendable. Okay, I don't know how many cups of coffee you can make in the commercial breaks. or <laughs> There's an awful lot of them, I suppose. But let's be realistic about it. The passage says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. It's practice. It's actually going, I'm turning this off. It's actually going, no, I don't need to see that. The other thing is, I mean, I read copiously books all over the place, okay? Um, I, I and I love novels. But I get to a point in some books I'm going, really? Is it necessary to have a sex scene in the middle of that? And the book's not finished. I was thinking of actually bringing the, the, my books to, um, to church and selling them um, for some mission or something, but I can't remember the ones I haven't read because they've got inappropriate stuff in them, so I don't feel I can sell them to you. But the thing with it is, we've got to go, no, if I'm going to turn off the television, I've got to be consistent, and I've got to put my book away and not read it, and books cost money. That's hard. What are the things we've got to cut out of our lives? We have to evaluate that. We have to make that decision. We have to wear the consequences if we are to grow. Part of our growth process is acting on the messages that we are told in Scripture and placing them in our lives. It's tricky, isn't it? No. We just have to do it. There is a consequence for doing what is right. We usually think of, the, 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 of consequences of being negatives. But here it says, and the peace and the God of peace will be with you. The consequence of being obedient to Jesus is that the God of peace is with you. Do you get that? There's a consequence to doing it right. And it's the presence of God. It's the presence of God with us. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty amazing that we have God with us. It's that Christmas concept of Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And we are told when what we've learned and received and heard and seen, when it's put into practice, God will be with us. How about that? How about that? So, the question that we finish on, where's my growth? Where's my growth? I'm 60 this year. Am I more spiritually attuned to God now than I was 10 years ago? I asked myself that question. Actually, I asked myself that question in January. What about you guys? Are you more spiritually further along in your walk with Jesus than you were five years ago, 10 years ago? Are you more truthful, honourable, just, pure, lovely and commendable than you were this time last year? Is there growth? And the interesting thing about the whole experience of the virus and stuff from the last 12 months, there has been an awful, well, not awful's a bad word, there has been a great lot of spiritual growth because we have confronted dis, uh, discontentment or we have confronted something which is, which is uncomfortable. And our spirituality has had to play into that. So we've grown spiritually because of the last 12 months. So it's been good for us. Yeah. Hasn't been easy? No. But it's been good for us, not only as individuals, but I think as a church. We've experimented, we've tried new things, we've done new stuff, we've cared for each other differently. A whole heap of stuff. But where is my growth? Okay, we flip that forward and say, where do I want to be in 12 months? Well, if you want to be spiritually keep going on your journey, you've got to go back to this passage and say, 
I need to investigate what is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. Don't you? We've got to walk this walk for our growth to continue. It's an easy template. I love the way the Bible gives us little templates to live our lives by. Okay? That's our template. That's our path to growth. We'll talk more about it next week. Let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you and praise you for this passage. There is so much more in there. And we ask, Lord, that you'll give us time to have a good look at it in, on into the future. Too, Lord, I ask that you will help us to be your people. For us to be the people who see things in you and then put it into practice in our lives. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the way that you care for us and you give us this learning experience. Lord, be with each of these people until you come. Amen. As we conclude this morning, final hymn, final song, Father, I thank you. A lot to thank the Lord for today. A lot of what we've learned, a lot of what we've heard. Pray that it might go with us through the week, that we will continue to think on these things. bless you and keep you during this week and until we see each other once again. Thank you.